Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see you here this morning at Calvary Lemon Grove. Well, let's uh, pray together. Father, as we start our morning, the first thing we want to do is bow before you, Lord. Your grace and your mercy in each of our lives is, is just so incredible. And we thank you for the lessons that you teach us, the reminders that you give us. And we pray, Lord, that as we worship and praise you, that you would be pleased. And we pray that you would open our hearts to your work today. We love you, Lord. Lift all this time to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll join us in standing. We'll worship our Lord together.
Psalm for us this morning. Psalm 36. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes. When he finds out his iniquity and when he hates, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. 
He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the workers of iniquity have fallen. They have been cast down and are not able to rise. Thank you, Michael. That's a perfect song for today. Not planned, except by God. Because we're going to look at Jude. When was the last time you read Jude? Uh, the reason I picked this is because just last week, Julie and I were reading the Bible at bedtime like we usually do, and we read the book of Jude. It's one chapter. And it seemed to fit so well with what our world is going through right now that I decided to pick that as a topic. How many of you have read Jude lately? Anybody? Not lately, but I have read it. <laughs> okay, you have read it. That's good. It's next to the last book in the New Testament, just before Revelation. It's one chapter, 25 verses. Lord, we, um, we pray that our time together in the Word would be fruitful for all of us, no matter where we are coming from as far as um, maturity or age, that this message would have something, this book of Jude would have something for each one of us today to encourage us, Lord, to not discourage but encourage, to draw us closer to you, that we would know you more. You'd strengthen our faith, Lord. You would use us to build your kingdom. Um, in our lives. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Jude was the brother of James. James wrote the book of James. James was the head of the Jerusalem church uh, in the first century. And they were both half-brothers of Jesus. So they came from the same family. Uh, they didn't believe in Jesus at the beginning. John 7, 5 tells us that. But after the resurrection, I believe they were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell and they saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. He's writing to Christians and he calls them the elect, the ones that are chosen by God to be saved because um, all of the Old Testament references that he uses are kind of given without a lot of explanation. And that's part of what I'm going to do is give you background information for those Old Testament references. But he assumes, I think, he's talking to Jewish believers and that they already know those Old Testament references. So let's turn to, um, hope you have your Bible, at least on your phone. Start with the first verse there. This letter, and I'm reading the New Living Translation. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, may God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. I think this is the only place where those three uh, attributes are joined together. Uh, mercy is... Um, justice that we don't deserve from God and peace he wants us to have peace with God 
and the peace of God. Those are slightly two different things. And love, of course. The major message from, from God always is love. If you're a Christian and you're angry and you're hateful and you're vengeful in your demeanor, you're getting it wrong. That's not the message that God delivered to us. We're born again to be filled with the love of God because God is love. So that's important to keep that in mind because we're going to talk about apostates. He spends most of the book talking about the people that um, have left the faith, but they're still in the churches and the congregations causing trouble, causing division, causing doubts and, and worries for people. But I'm going to expand that a little bit as we go along here. Dear friends, verse 3, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. So he was just going to write a letter of, of encouragement to people, but God changed his mind, put it on his heart to write as a warning about all the apostate people that he's seeing around in the churches. And I think in our world, I want to help us be aware of the different type of apostates that are around us. I don't think we have any in our church, to be honest. That's one of the advantages of a small church is that we all know each other and we are known. So that helps actually protect us. It's larger churches that don't always know the people that are coming in to visit and they may be apostates, but we're not worried about that. Uh, in general, there's two points I wanted to make that where law and works prevail, there is failure and death. The apostates tended to be legalistic. They tended to cause a lot of guilt and cause people to have doubts about their walk with the Lord, their relationship with God. And where law and works and the, uh, the Pharisees were exactly the same way. But where grace prevails, there is mercy. And Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So none of us can say that we're saved because we're good, that we've done enough um, good deeds or good works to earn salvation. It's never like that. We're saved by God's grace. We need to appreciate that. Uh, the peace that he gives us, Romans 5, 1 talks about, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we are forgiven, our sins are forgiven, and he fills us with his Holy Spirit, we now have peace with God. We don't have to be afraid of him. We don't have to worry about what he thinks about us. We can know with certainty that he loves us, and that will never change. Even when we fall, even when we sin, he's waiting for us to repent, ask forgiveness, and be restored, and the love never changes. That's important. And then Romans 5.5 5 talks about the love also. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit brings us that idea of love. And that's how we are to relate to one another. That's how we are to relate to apostates and the people in this world that are missing the mark. They don't understand God. Okay, I want to expand his idea of apostates because he talked about mostly the apostates in the church. And that's fine to be aware of that. But I think there's a lot more false religion in the world right now. I don't know about you, but see if you agree with this. I looked up religion just as a basic definition, and it says a belief in, on, belief in and worship of a superhuman power or powers, God or gods. That's a basic definition. But I think there's also religion going on in our world that doesn't include God at all. Another definition can be a pursuit or interest in which someone ascribes supreme importance. So something you latch on to that's the center of your life you can make a religion out of it. And then finally, human beings' relation to that which they regard as holy, sacred, absolute, spiritual, divine, or worthy of special reverence. So think about our world today. 
How many different religions are there in actuality? We don't have to look at just the, um, the organized religions that we're, that we're aware of, but I think there's a lot of isms going on. There's liberalism, Marxism, conservatism, fascism. By the way, fascism, is a, is a, people are confused about that. It's a, basically a single dictator with, that controls the people, the society, and the industries. Okay, it can be right or left. But many times I, I hear in the news it's ascribed to people on the right, and I don't think that's correct. Anyway, nationalism, socialism. Uh, socialism also is a public welfare comes first. That's supposedly what it means. But once people get in power, they don't tend to make it that way. They tend to take more power, and uh, they don't care so much about the, the uh, average person. Then also, I would add to this, the cult of abortion, the cult of LGBTQ and transgenders, the cult of climate change, the cult of equality of outcome, diversity, racism, and public school rights versus parental rights. Now, I know I'm getting political here. I don't want to get into the weeds in that. But think about all the people that are fanatics about their <clears throat> idea, what have you. It's a political idea. Political, po politics can be a religion for people. And they tend to be flaunting the virtues of God. Oh, thanks, son. They tend to be flaunting the virtues of God. Crazier it sounds, I think, the more satanic it is. Because Satan has an agenda. He wants to move people away from God. He wants to destroy Christians and destroy the idea of the one true God in the Bible for everybody else in their lives. So he distracts them with all these isms that they follow, and that becomes their religion. They don't need God because they're, they're getting their, their life, their purpose, their vitality, they think, from these things that they're pursuing. Of course, they don't deliver those things. They, do. they don't produce life. They don't produce happiness and peace. They produce negative things. So we must know sound doctrine. One of our defenses against heresy and against apostates and against all these isms and false religions is to know the word of God. There's no substitute for that. We know sound doctrine. And we must discern truth from error. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 22 in the King James, New King James says, Do not spice prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Okay, so we can't compromise. It's real easy again in this world to see people that call themselves Christians compromising in their values, and so we can go along with that and do the same thing. Be careful of that. That's a slippery slope that leads to more and more sin, more and more turning your back on God. Okay, let's go to verse 4. Verse 4, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So in, in Jude's time, the churches were a new thing. They mostly met in houses. And people from other disciplines, other religious thought, would come into their churches and try to overcome the sound doctrine. And one of the ones that was probably predominant, not quite yet during his time, but later on, was the Gnostics. They had a very weird way of looking at, at God. They didn't believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, they thought he was a force that created, but all physical things were bad, and knowledge was what they were after. That's why they were called Gnostics. It means knowledge. And uh, <laughs> salvation for them was knowledge of God, but not through the Bible. It's through dreams and uh, prophecies and other things that were easily um, uh, changed. They didn't believe that uh, Jesus was God, they thought he was a mere man who was inhabited by divine for the divine for a time. So it was just a very confusing thing. The 
They were ungodly in their thinking and living. Those are the people we need to watch out for in, in our lives. In 2 Timothy 3.5, we read in the New Living tra Translation, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that, that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And then another reference you could look up is 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. It has the same idea in it. Verse 5. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. So he's going to start going through all the Old Testament examples of how God did wonderful things for the people and they turned their back on him. God did wonderful things for the people, or they tried, to, so they tried to undermine what he was doing. And the first one is you'd find in the book of Exodus, uh, where he delivers the nation of Israel from the slavery in Egypt. It's the first time he really calls them a nation. He gives them a constitution and the Ten Commandments and all the other um, rules that follow that. And he delivers them into freedom. But they rebelled. Rebellion is a major problem um, for human beings and apostates is that they're rebelling against something about God. They're not satisfied with the way God has um, determined things and described things, so they're going to change it. And our, our world is in the midst of that right now. Globally, it's not just America. Globally, it's happening. Satan is moving in a way that is... I haven't seen in my lifetime. So um, the second thing he talks about is fallen angels. Verse 6, and I, remind, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. <clears throat> Now this is an interesting uh, topic because we don't know that much about the angels falling. We're given a few verses. If you want to write these down, take note of then Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Talks about uh, the tale of Satan sweeping down a third of the angels, the stars. 2 Peter 2, 4, Luke 10, 18, and uh, Ezekiel 28, 1 through 19 gives a pretty extensive description of Lucifer, the star of the morning, who, would, who wanted to be like God, he said, I will, I will be like God. And he was cast out of heaven. And we don't know much about them um, beyond what the scriptures say. So we need to be careful about giving them more power than they should have. They are created beings. They're not equal with God. They're not equal to Jesus. We don't have to fear them. They cannot possess Christians. So just know, understand the limits of uh, demons and fallen fallen angels. Okay. Verse 7. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns. It wasn't just those two towns, by the way. There's about five other towns around them that were destroyed. Do you remember that story? In the book of Genesis. For, uh, 19, Genesis 19. Uh, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Um, people that want to justify homosexuality and all of those letters today in our world don't understand scripture. They don't believe scripture. They don't accept it as true because Sodom and Gomorrah was um, destroyed not only because of that, there were other things that were going on there, but they had sexual perversion going on, and it's very obvious when uh, all the men of the city came to Lot's door, and they wanted those angels that had visited him to come out so they could have sex with them. It's very plain. It's very bold, the way they say it. So there's no confusion about it. Verse 8. In the same way these people who claim authority from their dreams, the, the apostates, live immoral lives, defy authority, 
and scoff at supernatural beings. Okay, so their lives are not something to be uh, envied or duplicated. They're unrealistic in their expectations. They're confused. They're slaves to corrupt desires of the flesh, like lust, and they pollute their own bodies. They defy authority. They have arrogance. They're self-willed. They're defiant, determined to have one's own way. Think of the protesters or the people that cause disruptions in uh, various places today. That describes them. They're angry. They're hateful. They think they're standing up for a right. They think they're defending their rights. And in reality, they're oppressing other people who just want to believe what they believe. And they don't believe in God for the most part. They dishonor God. They have no respect for biblical realities. Verse 9. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accused the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. All right, this is an interesting example. Um, we're not told in the Bible that, that God sent Michael to get Moses' body. Okay, that's not biblical. That comes from extra pseudopigraphical is what it's called. Um, anonymous writings in the Jewish tradition. So I'm not telling you to read those. All I'm saying is because Jude put that in there, we can accept that as part of God's scripture. Okay? So evidently there was a dispute, and Michael didn't directly rebuke Satan. He said, the Lord rebuke you. So that's sort of an example for us that we can't speak to demons like, like we're God, because we're not. Okay, so we're safer to say the Lord rebuke you just like Michael did instead of anything else. Okay, verse 10. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them. And so bring and so they bring about their own destruction. Uh, they speak evil of what they don't know about. They degrade themselves. I've already talked about that. Oh. There are people today that are really confused about basic things. We understand that God created male and female. And now there's a, a, a thing happening. I think it's mass hysteria that more and more people are believing that they're not what they were born to be, whether they're male or female. And I think it's tragic that they're confused and they seem to be in despair and they seem to be suicidal, many of them. But they're taught to blame us, Christians, because we don't agree with their gender dysphoria or whatever we call it. So we get the blame for it and it's really a mental process that they're going through that they're struggling with that they don't understand and they're being told that they that they're okay and anybody who doesn't approve of what they say or what they what they think is not okay and i think it's just the opposite i hope you see it in that in that light but god doesn't want us to hate them that's our problem it's very easy to be um righteously indignant with people that are like that and be hateful toward them. No, that's not our mission. That's not our call. If God's going to judge them, God will judge them. Our mission is to love them and to tell them about the gospel, which is hard. It's hard to do when they're being so, so negative and, and radical in their thinking. But we need to do that. So then he goes into some woes here, verse 11. What sorrow awaits them? For they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. He goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4? 3. No, 4, sorry, 4. Um, why did Cain kill his brother? Because he wasn't bringing the, the offering to God the way God described it to be. 
God wanted a blood sacrifice. Cain refused and he brought his grain that he because he was a farmer. And he was also jealous of his brother. And he was filled with hate. So those three things caused him to kill his own brother. So God doesn't want us to think that way. He doesn't approve of that kind of thinking. So people that are against Christianity in some form or they have some other religion, quote unquote religion, that they're following, they're the ones that usually are hateful. And we can't return that hate. We have to return more more wisdom. And then like Balaam, they deceive people for money. You see, you remember the story of Balaam. It's, it's three chapters in Numbers, so I can't really go through it, 22 through 25. But he's the one who was riding the donkey when the angel of the Lord stopped him, and the, and the donkey stopped. And he beat the donkey, and the donkey talked to him and said, Why are you beating me? Haven't I been faithful all these years? So that's a funny story that you hear in, in Sunday school when you're a kid. But the, the message really behind it was that he was not, a, he was not Jewish. He was Aramean. But he, he had some kind of divination prophetic gift that God chose to use to bless the nation of Israel. They were traveling through the land, leaving Egypt. They were in the Moabite and the Midian territory. And they were afraid of them because there were so many of them. There were two million. And uh, the king of Midian, now the king of Moab, wanted Balaam, who was a diviner, a prophet, to curse the nation. And he said, I'll just do what God tells me. I can't promise you anything. So he bribed him. He gave him money. And uh, every time he went to a high place to overlook the nation of Israel out there in the plain, he gave him a blessing instead of a curse. And the king would get angry. And then he'd go to another high place, he'd give him more money, and he'd give him another blessing instead of a curse. So the king was very frustrated. But Balaam's problem was not only that he was, he was trying to get money to curse God's people, but later on, I think it's in Numbers 31, he tells uh, the Midianites, I know what will hurt the Israelites. God will punish them if you send your Midianite women into the camp and seduce the Jewish men, the Israel, Israelite men, and, and lure them into worshiping false idols, then God will punish them. You don't have to worry about it. And that's exactly what they did. So Balaam was used by someone against God's people to deceive, deceive them and bring judgment upon them. So that's what we have to watch out for today, that people can call themselves Christians, but lure us into some kind of false belief that is going to ultimately be judged by God or cause you to fall away from God. So we don't want to do that. And then lastly in this group is Korah. They perish in their rebellion. They were in the midst of uh, following God through the wilderness, and Korah led a group of 250 rebels against Moses saying, who are you to lead us? You know, we don't want you to lead us anymore. And um, Moses just fell on his face and said, you know, God's going to show you who's, go who's going to be leader. And he ended up, God ended up um, killing all those re rebels. So rebelling against God's authority, rebelling against God is uh, not a good thing. Don't want to do that. Oh, I forgot. In uh, Numbers, Balaam, his final prophecy was messianic. He said, I see him coming, him meaning Messiah. Uh, and he's going to have a star and a scepter. So it was kind of vague, but still it was messianic. And because the spirit of the Lord came upon him at that time, the, th the third time he saw the nation of Israel on the plain. Okay, verse 12. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. So he starts giving some uh, examples from nature, more or less, um, of what they can do. You understand what reefs are. They're hidden under the water. Ships come along through the water and hit them and tear a hole in their boat and they sink. So it's, it's the deceptiveness, that he's, the covering that he's talking about. They like shameless shepherds 
who care only for themselves. Okay, shepherds are supposed to what? Feed the flock. They're supposed to care for the flock. But these people are like selfish. They're only thinking about themselves. And they don't care about feeding the flock or taking care of people spiritually. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. Okay, so they promise water for the thirsty souls, but they don't deliver. They can have um, a lot of promises um, for how you're going to benefit if you do what they do, follow them or believe what they believe, but they don't bring about any real prosperity. They're like trees in autumn that are doubly dead for they bear no fruit and they have, pulled, they have been pulled up by the roots. So trees that don't bear fruit are useless, but these, these trees that he's talking about are uprooted themselves and they don't even have any prosperity themselves. So they don't lead you into anything fruitful and they don't have anything fruitful themselves. Verse 13, for they're like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. So just bringing nothing, just foam. And then like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. Stars that move like shooting stars are not helpful for navigators. People that are in the, in the ocean trying to find where they're going can't follow something like that. They have to have stable, fixed stars to navigate from so they know where they're going. Verse 14. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So this is another example of Jude quoting a Jewish work that isn't biblical. So I'm just warning you about that. I have confidence in it because it's in the canonized word of God. So God must have given Jude the permission to use this and say it. But we don't have Enoch saying that in the book of Genesis. He was the one that was raptured, by the way, taken. He was, he was a righteous man, he was, and then he was not. So he was taken by the Lord. But that prophecy he's quoting there is not in the Bible. But it's a promise of a personal second coming of Jesus. And it's a personal coming, it's a universal coming, and it's a just coming. So the unjust will be judged. Verse 16. These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves, and they flatter others to get what they want. Okay, so again, describes what people you see on the internet, grumblers, complainers. Um, what, are the, what, are we, what are the words that we call them? I'm not up on all the terminology. Whiners. What? Whiners. Trolls. Trolls, okay. <laughs> Trolls. What else? You guys aren't, you guys aren't inter on the internet. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a good thing. Brag loudly. They talk loudly. Um, how many times has a conservative tried to give a speech at a, at a college and they have people in the audience to just shout them down? They don't allow them to speak what, what they want to say. Uh, but that's okay. But then if you try to interfere with what they say, then you're curtailing their free speech. So it's, a, it's not a two-way thing. It's not fair. It's just one way all the time. They're haters, they're fault finders, they find no fault in themselves. Only their desires are important. Only their rights are protected. Only their speech is allowed. They flatter others to get their own advantage. They're discontented, they're egotistical, they're deceptive. Well, once again, remind you that before we were saved, we were just like that. Maybe not in such an obnoxious form, but we were just like that. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm 
not believing anything that was good, not believing what God said, making fun of Christians. How many of you ever made fun of Christians before you were saved? I sure did. Verse 17. Uh, but you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. So throughout the New Testament, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2, 1, uh, are worth talking about in the last times, in the end days, there's going to be um, people that are going to do the things that we're seeing. And it's kind of, kind of amazing, scoffers, creating division, following their natural or fleshly instincts. And they don't have God's Holy Spirit. Okay, so 20. He gets to the central message finally after all of this negative. Despite Satan's tactics of hate, division, fear, and violence, he wants us to act like this. Verse 20. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you to eternal life, or will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. So there's four participles of action here. Building, praying, expecting, and keeping. Building is personal edification, progressing in the knowledge of your most holy faith. So study scripture. Study scripture. If you don't read the Bible on a regular basis, you're weaker than you realize, scripturally, truth-wise. Truth you need to be in the Word. Even if you've read it, read it again. Read it again. You'll see new things that you haven't read before, you haven't remembered before. Praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, out of hearts that are indwelt and illuminated and filled with the Spirit. Pray. Ask God to help you pray. Ask God to help you understand what to pray for. Don't just follow a pattern or what other people do. Ask God how he wants you to pray and who to pray for and how to pray and all that kind of thing. I, I Believe me, it will bring you closer to God. If you say you want to be closer to God, you want to know God more, pray. Pray more. Mm -hmm. Keeping. Keep yourselves in the, in God's, safe in God's love. In God's love, we are nurtured by God as we seek to know Him. As we fellowship with Him, we know Him more. As we fellowship with Him, we know Him more. John 14, 21 is one of my favorite scriptures because it says, as you obey God and walk with Him, He will reveal or disclose Himself to you. I want that. I want Him to reveal Himself more to me. So we walk with him in obedience, reading the word of God, praying the way he wants us to pray. He'll reveal himself more and more to us. It's not, um, it's not because we earn it. It's not because we deserve it. It's because we desire it. He desires to be with us. He desires to spend time with us and to be known. We're the ones that are too busy running around doing things that, you know, if you're honest about it, if you look at your daily calendar, how many hours? Do you have, any of you get a report on your phone of how many hours you're on the internet? How many hours? What's, what's the other breakdown? Can't remember. Oh, uh, how many hours you're on the Bible app? Okay, it's hours. Mary Alice, you shook your head, yes. Um, if you get that report, check it out. Okay, it's hours you spend with stuff that you don't ever remember. Just videos, cat videos, <laughs> whatever. Hey, we can do without that. Dog videos. Dog videos, not cat videos. What? Dogs. Dog videos, not cat videos. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, cats are bad. <laughs> <laughs> now you're getting political. <laughs> um, and the fourth one is keeping. In God's love, we are, no, I said that already. Waiting, sorry looking expectantly for the blessed hope of the return of Jesus for his church. That's an important thing, that you believe in the second coming. Because it, it helps us keep our eyes kind of above and beyond the stuff that's happening. Imagine if you 
were not a believer, try to take yourself back to that, and the stuff was going on in the world that's going on today, would you look forward to the future? Would you say, oh boy, I can't wait till they take propane away from us, uh, natural gas, or they make us eat bugs instead of meat? I can't wait for that. It's going to be great. No, we would not have any kind of hope at all. We'd be in despair. And that's coming too, by the way. Verse 21. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And 22. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Okay, so he wants us to use that closeness that we have with God to reach out to others. And I think, I think there's a connection that the closer we are with the Lord, the easier it is to reach out and, and, share, and share the gospel with other people. Or at least your testimony. Because God is more on your mind. He's more present with you. You're more kind of in touch with him on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And when you come up against somebody who's a doubter or a non-believer or whatever, it's easier to say, can I tell you about my walk with the Lord? Can I tell you how I met Jesus? Because that's always a powerful way to witness to people is to tell them your story, how you came to know the Lord. But do it with caution. If you're an alcoholic, don't go to the bar to, rescue, to witness to people. I mean, that kind of idea. That's not safe for you. That's dangerous for you. So if you have some kind of weakness and uh, you think uh, you're being called to this weak area to witness to people, probably not. That's probably not God calling you there. You know, keep yourself, keep yourself safe. So I want to close with the prayer that he closes with at the very end of this book. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him, who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. And I'll add, Lord, help us. Help us to, to know you. Help us to want to know you. Help us to be the lights in the world that you want us to be. And to be the ambassadors of love to those around us that don't know you. In your name, Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God bless you. Have a great week.